for many music makers out there, times are tough. So many ways that we put food on a table have been postponed or taken away. So cue to our sound advice series. Uh, today we will be joined by VP of Creative a &R for Atlas Music Publishing, Latoya Lee, and Grammy-winning songwriter-producer Bruce Wayne, part of the MIDI Mafia, and VP of Transparency Entertainment Group to answer that evergreen question, how do songwriters make money? Let's get to it by ASCAP's own Christina Chavez. Thank you, Crystal. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Chavez from the Rhythm and Soul Department here at ASCAP, and thanks for joining us at the ASCAP Experience Home Edition. As Crystal stated, today we'll be talking about how songwriters get paid. There are a lot of ways songwriters can make money, even if you're not super famous and you don't perform your, uh, your own music. Today we're going to outline some of the major income streams avail available to you as a songwriter. Some of them will be familiar and some of them a little more obscure, while others are still emerging. My hope is that you'll get a better idea of how the music, the, how the money flows for the songwriters. Remember to send us all your questions in the chat box and hopefully um, we'll have some time to answer those questions at the end of the panel. So I'd like to welcome our special guests, Latoya Lee and Bruce Wayne. Latoya, let's start with you. How did you get started in the industry and where do you foresee yourself in the future? You want the short version? Or yeah, let's do the short version. We got 30 minutes. So um, yeah, you know, I've been doing music since I was a kid, since 10 years old. Um, my stepdad had a record label and recording studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so every day after school, basketball practice, band practice, um, I was in the studio. Um, I grew up playing the saxophone. I grew up singing, rapping, writing, producing. I pretty much did everything. And then when I went to college and I started interning, um, I mean, like everything always was me wanting to be on the business side, wanting to find and develop talent. So when I so when I started like getting these comparisons to the likes of Sylvia Rohn at 19, 20 years old, I'm like, well, I'm getting compared to her now at 19, 20 years old. Just imagine a year, five years, 10 years from now. So that's when I decided to transition from being on the more on the specifically just creative front to being on the executive creative front to some degree. Um, and then from there, I became an assistant at Convict at the height of Convict. Um, and so I was an assistant there to the SVP. And then I brought an artist in while I was still in college. These girls that I mentored were like, oh my God, our friend, she sings and she dances like, yo, because everybody on campus knew that I did music and I was at Convict. So I brought her in, uh, Boo, who's, you know, who's, you know, who's Akon's brother and also one of the owners of Convict. He had just gotten a joint venture with uh, Def Jam, Boo Vision slash Def Jam. So he was like, all right, you know, since you brought her, show me what you can do. And that was my first a and role. And mm. so I was like about to graduate from college in like two months and I'm an A&R in my city. You can't tell me nothing. Love <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and then, you know, after a while being from Atlanta at that point, it, you know, I was just like, well, I'm out of school now. I feel like I, I kind of hit my ceiling here. I want to go. And then that's when, you know, Mike Karen, um, I reached out to Mike Karen after he got his new role at Warner Music Group as the um, president of Worldwide A&R. He brought me on. This was in 2012. I spent five and a half years at um, Warner Music Group. Uh, A&R, Trey Songs is Trigger and Tremaine, uh, signed Cranium, L.A., Sabrina Claudio. Did the Fast and Furious 7, 8 soundtrack, Suicide Squad, GDFR, See You Again, I Don't Get Tired. Oh, my goodness. After five and a half years, you know, I decided that I wanted to add an additional layer to myself. So I decided to transition in, into the publishing space. And so now I'm at Atlas Music Publishing, where I have Mari Beats, who's done, who did uh, Babysitter for the Babies, done records for Gucci Mane, uh, Ty Dolla Sign, g -E -Z, Frank Nitti, who's written for Trey Songs, Fifth Harmony, uh, Major Maja, and then I'm still building the roster at this point. But yeah, so. That's, that's a great start, girl. That's a great start. <laughs> yeah, that's dope. <laughs> right. I what didn't know that. You, what about you, Bruce? Tell us how you got started and, you know, where you are now and what, what do we see in the future? Oh, well, I'm originally from um, New York, Brooklyn, East New York. I was part of this rap crew. And then we couldn't buy any beats from anybody. So I just started making beats. I got this investor. And then, you know, I just started selling records independently. And that's how I built like all of my relationships in New York from the Ebros to the DJ enough. So I just started meeting everybody. And then, you know, I had a falling out with the investor, but I learned so much business wise that I was like, yo, I really want to like 
take this. Deep. I want to be on a creative a little bit more. So I just started instead of being like rapping and all of that kind of stuff. I was like, you know, let me go with this beat thing. I met my partner Swift maybe like eight months after that. Yeah. And then, yo, we had 21 questions. So it was just like super fast for me. Classic. So, and then, you know, and also too, but I made beats, but I loved the business of it. I, I did it was like, I like being in the studio and all of that, but I like doing the deals, you know? And I like, I liked like, yo, I, I liked cursing at the lawyer. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I liked it, you know what I mean? For some reason, but I didn't want to be a manager or anything like that. I just liked the business. Yeah. So um, speaking of Sylvia Rome, she put us on, Merlin Bob, they gave us like in our positions, they positioned us for, um, to, to, groom, to groom us to like run black music and everything. And then Sylvia lost that position. And then we got moved over to Atlantic. So then Craig Conklin took us under his wing. Then after a while, it was Def Atlantic. <laughs> and then like, because everybody from Def Jam came over. But through that whole tenure, I just learned a lot of the business. You know, Julie Greenwald, Mike Kaiser, everybody. It was just so much like information. And they broke a lot of the artists that I loved, like Jay-Z and everything over at Def Jam. I was just like a huge fan. And so then, you know, I was like, let me get back to the music. And then we did When I See You with Fantasia. We started doing, we were developing Frank Ocean. Like he just was a writer at the time. And then, you know, we decided to come to LA and then we got a house and we just built like three studios in it. And the entire world started coming through all of like the dopest songwriters from James Fauntleroy to Luke James to Stacey Barth to August Rigo, like all of the dope dudes that was coming up at that time. Everybody liked being at the house. So then, you know, again, I loved more of the business. And then once Frank Ocean took off, it was like, I didn't, I wasn't really passionate about working with that many artists because when, when you work with an artist like that, it's just so unique and so fresh and it moved so much. And then he's like my brother. It was just like, I just wasn't really passionate to produce for anybody like that. So I was like, let me, let me make a transition. And then I said, let me just really go into the business part of it. And then, Getting into the business, me and Swift started getting more into the sync and licensing space organically because we've always worked in it. But when you're in the sync and licensing, you can't really have one foot in and one foot out. You have to be all the way in, all the way out. So we just was like, let's go all the way in. And then we started working really close with extreme music. We built the television, we built our own music library. It's like one, it's the number one music library for urban music right now. And then, but we can't say urban anymore. Uh, <laughs> black music right now <laughs> and um and then you know getting more into the publishing and then while i was doing that i started to identify a lot of unclaimed royalties for artists and then i just was like you know what like this is a great way to give back and that's where transparency was born out of so i still do the library music heavy and sync tons of placements between like <laughs> advertisement trailers promos and I'm finding people money and getting them money, you know? Like I like I just it's really that simple. And got it. Okay. All right. So let's just jump right into this. Um, but before we get started, it's important to understand the difference between the composition side and the master side. Most of what we're gonna be talking about is on the composition side. That's where um the songwriter does they compose. So Bruce, can you describe the difference between the composition side and the master side? Um, yeah, so as we know what cop what a with every, every song, songs a copyright, there's two rights associated with it, like you said, the master and the composition side. On the composition side, it deals more with, like you said, composing. What that really means is like what you're writing, what you're arranging, like what you're putting down on that paper, the idea of it, whatever, whatever. So that's what you're composing. The master side is more of what you're hearing. In the technical term of master is sound recording. So you may write it, but then there's the melody. You know what I'm saying? So the melody is on the sound recording, the master side. That's the best way and simplest way to explain it. And I'm sure like Latoya can get even deeper on that side of it. I mean, would you like to touch on it a little bit more Latoya or you think he covered it? I mean, I think he pretty much covered it. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. Yeah. You know? That's like as simple as it can get. Okay. <laughs> you know? So let's jump into PROs. So PROs represents the songwriters, composers, and publishers. They license the public performance of um, your music so you get paid royalties when your music is played on the radio, streaming services, TV, live venues, et cetera. When your song gets played somewhere, the business pays ASCAP and we pay our members. What would you say, and either one of you guys can answer this, what percentage of income um, would you say comes from the performance royalties? 
Uh, that's Latoya all day. Um, <laughs> Latoya. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's it's about like fifty percent um, comes from the performance royalties, um, and then you have the other percentages. But you're specifically asking about the performance royalties, so, right? Yeah, over yeah. like about fifty two percent. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, so let's talk about syncs. And Bruce, this is more to you because you said you started your own syncing company now. Um, when music is synchronized, it is to picture. So it could be a movie, a TV show, a webisode, a video game, etc. It usually involves the upfront free on both the composition and the master side. Um, the fees are negotiated with the publisher so, those, so there's no set rate. Um, Bruce, let's say one of our viewers approached we're, we're approached about using their song on a film or a TV series. What are some of the things they should consider when they're negotiating a price? Um, the, the, the easiest way to do it is break it into tiers, right? If it's something that's like music libraries, which is more like blanket licensing, those rates are between 500 to say 5,000. If it's promo and promos, like, you know, like say a new show is coming out and they, Hey, new show coming out, airing this day, whatever, whatever. Like that's more like five thousand to twenty thousand. When it's trailers, trailers, we all know what trailers are. That's more like twenty five thousand to say seventy five thousand. You know what I'm saying? It could be upwards of even a hundred thousand. When it's advertisement, it could be whatever. There's no number. It usually starts at between seventy five, a hundred thousand, and go up. So you have to kind of understand what your song is being used for. You know, and then whatever those numbers are, they're always splitting half. So say if it's one hundred thousand dollars, fifty thousand is for the publisher side, fifty thousand is for the master side. So when you're factoring what you want to get paid, you have to think about what's your role, because not everybody does everything. You know, so you know what I'm saying? Because if you could write it, but you may not perform it. So if you don't perform it, you're not on the master side. You know, it's like these different layers. So you have to kind of just know what your role is and what it's going to be used for, and that'll help you come up with a realistic. Got it. Okay. Next up is money you get from distributors, places like CD Baby, TuneCore, DistroKid that get your music on all streaming services and online stores. Um, are you paid? So, and this is to either one of you guys, whoever is more comfortable. Are you paid by the distributor, or are you, or by each of the streaming services directly? People think the streaming services are supposed to pay them, or the distributor is supposed to pay them. So, who is supposed to pay them? Well, um. As a publisher, we can go directly to the DSP, um, which is Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Tidal, YouTube, like all the DSPs, um, Pandora, or we can, you know, or or in some or or in most cases, you um you commission an agency like Harry Fox, um, who who then in turn distribute the streaming royalties for those services back to the publishers, therefore also paying the songwriter. Got you. Go ahead. To add to that, your distributor, whether it's a TuneCore or it could even be an Empire or whatever, they're no different than a PRO. They're out there collecting from the different DSPs, so it could all come one place. So they're more like an aggregator. So they are paying you directly, but they're hiring somebody to go collect it for you. Got it. Okay. And Latoya, can you describe what it's meant by mechanical royalty and what kind of situation will result from that? Um, well, okay, so with mechanical royalties, so we're now we're now like in this digital, the streaming age. So before mechanicals were only, you know, based on CD physical sales. And then when physical sales started to decline, then, you know, the creators were trying to figure out, well, where does that money come from now? Um, so now that so now that we're in this new age of the streaming, then, then, then now, then now the creators are starting to see the benefits of, of of understanding what those mechanical royalties are supposed to look like, or what that mechanical income is supposed to look like, because because we're streaming, the consumer is streaming at such a high rate now, especially like right now in this quarantine that we're all in, you know. So just imagine what a lot of people's mechanical royalties are going to look like um, in the next six to nine months. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, again, it's like it, it, it breaks up because you, like I said earlier, it's like about 52%. So this is based on the National Music Publishers Association, um, NMPA. So, so they said last year there was 52% um, performance royalties 
23% was sync, 19% was mechanical, and then 6% was miscellaneous. So like print sheets and sync sheets, I mean, excuse me, prints, um, um, sheet music and like song and like song book and stuff like that. So that's how, so that's how you're able to actually see what the benefit of mechanical royalties are. Got you. And how, and I'll go ahead. I'm sorry, Bruce, were you saying something? I think you were gonna ask a question and I'm, I think you're about to ask it. Oh, okay. I was going to say, how does a songwriter get paid when an album or a track they wrote is downloaded or sold? Like mechanical royalties, how do they get paid? So, so, um, so basically, like, let's just keep it simple. Spotify, a song streams. There's a rate with it. That money goes to your distributor. But that, um, but Spotify is also is also responsible for paying that mechanical rate to the publisher. So, so every time a stream. There's like two to three revenue streams. You know what I'm saying? One is just the fee, then there's the mechanical rate that goes to the publishers, and then there's the um, performance on the master, which is neighboring rights. You know, yeah. that's that's what that is. So that's where your sound exchange money comes from. If that makes any sense. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. So right now the publishers we're fighting to make sure that that the rate on the DSP side is equivalent or at least as close to what what the master side is getting exactly that's what's funny. Gotcha. Where, where 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 it drops off is when you're an independent artist and you don't have a publisher so that's why you need an administrator right because the administrator will will act as the you're your publisher you have an administrator and an administrator is the one that's collecting that for you but most independent artists don't have an administrator, don't have a publisher, so they can't turn that revenue stream on. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Because they're independent, they don't don't know how to go get the money. Yeah, it makes sense. Oh, and Latoy, my next question, you kind of touched on this in regards to Harry Fox. Um, can you get into a little more detail what it is that they do exactly and what might an independent songwriter consider um signing up with them? Like what are the benefits of it? Um so Harry Fox is a mechanical rights society. So they are, so they serve as the liaison between the record labels, the streaming services, and the publishers. So they collect, analyze, license, and distribute mechanical royalties to the publishers and the songwriters. So specifically for, for someone who's not signed to a publishing company, then they would have to commission Harry Fox to go and get all of their all of their mechanical royalties and pay them out. But then a lot of, but then a lot of, like how Bruce said, a lot of a, a lot of artists, songwriters, producers, they don't they don't know this information. Um, so then there's so much money left out there because they're just depending on ASCAP or the record label to pay them their royalties. But then there's way more money out there that they're not aware. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. Okay. And the, the next, so that leads me into um, the Mechanical License Collective that was set, um, set up by the Music Modernization Act, a law that was passed in 2018. Can you describe, any one of you guys, can you describe if it'll impact how songwriters are getting paid? Man, I, I honestly don't. <laughs> I know the idea of the MLC is a good idea, but I don't, I don't know too much about it. And so I wouldn't want to steer any of um the, the viewers or listeners in the wrong direction because it's, it's being built right now. It's just so new. It's just just new. And so we can say something today and literally in two months, that shit may change. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So and maybe Latoya may know more than I do. Um, but I just know that they're, they're building those teams to, to make sure it's done right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's still everything is still being worked out, you know, just like how we're talking about with the rates, with the DSPs. It's like the, the music, the music business is constantly evolving, it's constantly changing and new things are being implemented every time we turn around, even when we're looking at Twitch or we're looking at TikTok and we're looking at Instagram and Facebook. How, you know, how right now we're in this quarantine age where all these DJs, they want to just be able to go on and just spin and they can't because the music is being blocked. You know what I mean? So it's just like the music, you know, the industry is constantly changing. But the thing with the MMA is that I think that I think that ultimately down the line, like once, you know, they it's actually figured out where, you know, more more people are actually getting their uncollected royalties. People will actually see the benefit of it um, because because it is, you know, it will be a licensing agency for digital mechanicals. 
and it'll update, modernize, streamline how digital mechanical royalties are licensed and collected and then distributed back to the publishers and back to the songwriters. So, so just like how Bruce was talking about earlier with getting people paid on, you know, unclaimed royalties or unclaimed, you know, money that's out there for them. So then you'll, so then you'll see less royalties would go uncollected and then there will be better data and it'll be faster and more transparent than the current system. Got it. Okay. And we're going to, this is the last topic before we start going into the questions from our audience. Um, so uh, publishing income, unless you signed a publishing deal, every songwriter is by default their own publisher too. So for all sorts of royalties, PRO income, mechanicals, et cetera, you'll be getting paid as both a writer and a publisher. Latoya, first question is for you. Can you talk about how the deals usually break down at Atlas when people sign up with you guys as a songwriter or get signed to you guys as a songwriter because they can't just sign up? Well, you know, I ain't going to give all the sauce. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I'll just say, you know, like most publishers, um, you know, you have to take into consideration their catalog and their pipeline um, because that'll ultimately determine what type of deal, you know, you can put forth if it can be an admin deal. Like a lot of people out here, they're all screaming out admin deals. Well, if you understand what an admin deal comes with, that comes with exactly what it says, admin. That is all they are signed up to do is collect on your behalf. Anything in regards to you creatively, that's where a co-publishing situation will be more beneficial for you. Yes, that is you. Yes, that is you giving up half of your ownership. But then, but then, but then it's some. But then, but then your publisher has more, um, more will to actually work on your behalf um, because because it's a mutually beneficial relationship versus just a 90-10 split or an 80-20 split. So, like I said, you know, with with most of the deals, you're it's contingent on what the catalog looks like. That means placements that you've already had in the past or that are already out right now. And then also what you have in the future, which we which we usually call the pipeline. So that'll be, you know, so that'll help us determine what your advance looks like, what your, you know, if, you know, most most labels, excuse me, most publishers at this point, I hope they I hope that they are getting rid of the MDRC. You know what I mean? Because and just and just moving into recoupable, because then that also helps with 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 the writers and producers being able to get out of their publishing deals when they actually recoup and make the money back that they that they received in their advance. Got you. OK, so I'm going to jump right into the questions from one of the audience members it's from Yasmin. And this is for you, Bruce. Um, what is the best way to sign up with a sync agent? That's a very hard. That's that's hard. It's no different than um, getting with a publisher. You know, it's about trying to figure out what's the right partnership for you. You know, so um, I honestly don't think you you need an agent. I think you need to work with people like you, Christina, uh, working with you, Latoy. It's like kind of feeling your way out. When you get with an agent, you're just somebody else that's on on their book. It's not there's no there's no invested interest in it unless you make money. So you're just somebody else on a roster. When you're working with say like you like working with you you went you two women, there's some kind of invested interest with it. You know what I'm saying? Like you're a society, you're you're a company. It's like yo, I can help this person. They got a great talent. They could potentially make money. Let me work with them. Yo, this is somebody that could be great here. This is our job. We're not profit. We're a blah. We're a society. Like it's about the partnerships and kind of meeting as many people as possible. An agent, I don't think is the right way to go. You know, it's about, I think the referrals are better. The sync is really, 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 really close. Like they, it's it's a very closed world. They don't let every and anybody in. Right. So they, it's very referral based, you know? So is it common for a songwriter to have a manager to help them out with these things? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Like that manager will work closely with their publisher. The manager will work closely with their PRO or their CMO, or they're making those kind of relationships, you know, um, that's better than an agent. You know, you don't, you don't need to do that. You just, just on somebody else's list, you know, and plus anybody got to prove themselves, you know, like, like I said, it's a very closed world, you know, being with an agent doesn't guarantee placements. Right. It's about, the it's about the music and who's referring it. Gotcha. And this is from Jules. Um, what is the best advice for an independent songwriter? Uh, oh, um, you mean for licensing and stuff like that? Or just in general? Just in general. Um, yeah. Mm, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's very general. Yeah, that's real general. Um, 
best way to get music in front of people who make license that make licensing decisions. Um, well, no, I was talking about number seven, independent songwriter, but it's fine. Um, we could talk about licensing no, decisions. I mean, listen, I'll I'll throw it out there. The advice that I would give is um, okay. So, like, let's say you want to get to um, so so for instance, right when we created um, I don't get tired, right for Kevin Gates for Gates. You know, I had B Mac. You know, or like us as the A and R's, we were like, "Yo, Gates keeps on saying I don't get tired, I don't get tired, I don't get tired." Like every single video on his Instagram, he's saying I don't get tired. So we need to create a record that's that's around that's around this new saying of his, and that's how I don't get tired was created. So I think that so I think that a lot of songwriters, as opposed to just 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 basing your basing your creative, you know, ability on on what you hear. From a from an artist, you know, from what they put out, you should be paying attention to their social media, their interviews, the things that they're saying, the things that they're doing, and you know what their you know like what their life looks like, you know, in the scope of what they've actually put out there for the public, and then that'll ultimately help you in 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 getting to them in a more relatable way. And then also, you know, let's say for instance, you know, producer producer X is always in with the artist that you want to get in with. Well, then make sure that you connect with producer X so that way y'all can build a relationship. And then that way, that's your way in to even get closer to the artist, but also go in knowing that these are already things. These are already the things that I found out about this artist that I want to work with. So let me make sure that I'm writing songs that are catered to that artist. So that way when I go to producer X, he's like, oh, yeah, produce, you know, artist Y is going to love this record. Oh, my God. Write some stuff to my beats for this artist. And then that's how you usually that's that's just that's, that's the cheat code a lot of people don't know mm. what, I, what i would add is become as self-sustainable as possible you know um 90 of the work that we got and what we did is because i'm a songwriter i also make beats my partner is a mix engineer makes beats and also a dj you know what i'm saying so um once so when we did everything we didn't need anybody so I noticed that a lot of writers and producers, they're doing a lot of it themselves. So I think true collaboration, what Latoya is saying, true collaboration is key, but also making yourself as self-sustainable as possible. Like if you're writing, try to learn how to make beats to engineer, do something. Like you gotta do more now. You can't just be like, well, I write. Like that's just not enough. Plus you can make more money doing more. So why wouldn't you do it? You know? Absolutely. And like, make sure like that turnaround is there being, you know, like right now we're in this court, like we literally been quarantined for like three or four months. How many of these writers that are asking these questions have been at home writing songs and and cutting themselves and like actually like recording the vocals and just getting a bunch of demos down as opposed to being like, oh, my God, I don't got a studio. I can't go in with this producer. Or I can't go in with this writer. Figuring out other ways to make stuff happen and not just depending on being in the big time studio to make it happen because self-sustainability is way more important than, than okay. depending on the next person to help you get where you want to go. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I hope we and we can't get to any more questions because we're just about done. But I want to thank you guys again for participating. I definitely appreciate it, especially during this quarantine and everything else that's going on in society right now with Black Lives Matter and everything else. So thank you again. I appreciate it. Yes, oh, thank, thank you. you so much. We really appreciate that. We hope that you guys got a lot of information and in answering this you know, these really hard topics. And it's just an illuminating discussion. And thank you to the panel once again. We appreciate you. Thank you, guys. All right, guys. Be good. Bye.